Hi, I'm Mitch Gallagher. Welcome to the Sweetwater Minute. We have a special guest joining us today. Jordan Rudis from Dream Theater is here. All right. Glad Hello, to Mitch. see you. Thanks, Thanks for coming man. in. It's good to be here. I've been keeping you busy. Very busy. Yeah. It's been a very full week, but it's been great. Yeah, we had a, a workshop last night and uh, yeah. master class tonight. Yep, some recording with wow. the, the boys in the studio, which is amazing. Nice. It's been a very large, full, exciting time here. And now you're here on the Sweetwater Minute. How much more is it only one minute? It's is only it? one minute, so well, you got to talk, talk fast. Quick. Let's go. <laughs> <laughs> so, Dream th Theater, The Dregs, Liquid Tension Experiment, Rudis Morgenstein. I mean, so many different projects and lots of great things going on. Take a step back and tell us how you got into playing, uh, playing music. Oh, well, um, I got into it uh, by starting to play the piano at a very young age. Mm -hmm. uh, it was kind of surprising for everybody because I hadn't taken any lessons and I was uh, playing in my second grade classroom on the little piano that they had in the corner uh, until one day the teacher called up and said uh, to my mom, she said, hey, your child is playing the piano so well. Right. My mother was like, what are you talking about? He doesn't know anything about the piano. We don't have a piano. So, uh, and she said, well, you should really get one because he plays very nicely. That's incredible. So uh, that's kind of how it got started. Right, right. Yeah. So what, what was it that drew you to the piano? Do you remember? I just, you know, was sitting there in the corner and I would reach over and I kind of would plunk a couple of notes and then I think I kind of understood fairly quick, quickly the relationship between them right. and uh, started to enjoy playing. So. Right, right. Yeah. Now you have perfect pitch, Yes. correct? At that <laughs> age, were you hearing things that you wanted to pick out and play? Um, it's hard to remember. This was in second grade, sure. exactly what was happening. So uh, I guess because I do have perfect pitch, it's probably a little easier. One, I mean... You, I imagine that one has to say, okay, this is this note, that's that note, before things start to come together. Right. But, uh, I mean, once they did, it, that's probably the reason that I was able to uh, understand, okay, if I hit that note, it'll make that sound. If I hit that one, it'll make that sound. Right, right. Yeah. Right. So you must have progressed very quickly because at nine, you entered Juilliard. Yeah, well, things definitely happened pretty fast. I had a, um, one of these teachers that comes around to your house, like, and, you know, gives you a half, hour, half an hour lesson. They don't do that so much anymore, but this right. guy did. And I started with the little red book, was it the Thompson book or something like that? Mm -hmm. And it was only a couple of lessons at that, and then he kind of took that away. And he started to teach me all the chords, which I was really interested in, because I was just like kind of figuring out how to play songs. Um, but one day, a friend of my mom's came by and said, wow, you know, it's kind of weird that this teacher is coming by and teaching Jordan for free now. What's that about? Right. So um, she recommended this other woman that she knew that was a more serious teacher and uh, ended up switching teachers to this woman. Uh, her name was Magda, a Hungarian woman, kind of a wild woman, uh, in the sense of being very like passionate and a little bit temperamental as well. And the funny thing about her was that her son was the keyboard, there's a piano player for Guy Lombardo's band. Oh, wow. Right? But he had been uh, a Juilliard student, had gone to the college, but didn't go into classical music. Mm -hmm. So when Magda met me, she thought, okay, this one is going to stay with classical music. This is the one who's <laughs> going to be serious and not leave. Right. So she pretty quickly prepared me to go for a Juilliard audition with that in mind. And um, I learned all the Beethoven, the Bach, all the stuff that was needed for the audition. I went in, I auditioned, and I got in. Mm -hmm. Of course, when I got in, my teacher, Catherine Parker, looked at me playing and said, okay, that's very nice, but let's start more at the beginning, like learn the right technique. Uh -huh. So that's kind of... So you kind of had to break it all down and rebuild it back up again? I did a bit, yeah. But mm -hmm. that was great, because, you know, the foundation of my musical life on the keyboard is my technique. <clears throat> and I take a lot of pride in what I learned. I mean, her lineage was so great, because she was a student and an assistant to Rosina Levine, mm -hmm. who was like one of the, you know, greatest teachers in our recent history. Right. So I feel like, wow, I was very lucky in that regard to yeah. get, you know, to kind of, to have that happen. Right, what a tremendous opportunity to study with, with yeah, someone like totally. that. Yeah, totally. I mean, and it really carries over to whatever I do, whether it's, you know, playing classical music or playing whatever rock, because if I want my fingers to move and do what's inside my head, I mean, that's what it's all about, yeah, you yeah. know? Sure, so, yeah. sure. So how long were you at Juilliard? Uh, I started when I was nine, and I left there when I was 19. Mm -hmm. yeah. And what happened? How did you uh, decide to what leave? What happened? Well, when I was about 17 or so, people started to uh, turn me on to some of the uh, you know, cool music they were listening to, some of the like, progressive rock, some Genesis, and 
I don't know, Gentle Giant and, and, and uh, ELP. I can remember like vividly the day one of my friends brought over the Tarkus album. And I listened to that and I was like, oh my God, that is so amazing. What struck me was the, the intense power, the fact that this guy was playing a keyboard and it was so like rock, you know? Right. And I didn't, I wasn't aware of that before. I kind of was actually playing with some of the similar kind of harm, harmonic things because I was a composer very mm -hmm. young as well. And I was doing a lot of stuff with sus chords and fourths. And, but when I heard Emerson do it, I was like, wow, that's amazing. That plus a little Six Wives of Henry VIII and some Patrick Moraz and Refugee thrown in, I started to like put up all these pictures on the wall of Mini Moogs and like Rick Wakeman and all this stuff. And my <laughs> bedroom wall was covered with all this stuff. And so I was kind of leaning towards you know, that direction. At the same time I was getting ready to go to college and make that leap because I was in the pre-college of Juilliard and it's a separate division. You have to re-audition. Mm. Um, so, you know, due to the influence of teachers and parents and whatever and the fact that I've been doing it so long, I actually did go and do my audition and I passed the audition. I got in with a scholarship. I did well because mm -hmm. I'd been a pretty serious classical music student. Um, I got in. I started to study with uh, this woman called Adele Marcus, uh, who's another great teacher. Um, but, uh, you know, it started to get to the point where my interests were so strong in this other kind of music and all these other instruments that um, it was one day that I walked in and I was playing the Chopin G minor ballade, which is a, I don't know, 30, 40 page piece. And I thought I was playing it pretty well, but uh, Adele Marcus came over, she took the music away, and then I stopped. She said, why did you stop? I said, well, I need the music. I've only been playing it for a week. She was like, well, that's unacceptable. When you study with me, you need to memorize it after a week. Hmm. I was like, okay. And that was my last lesson. Because at that point, I felt empowered enough and you know, just so passionate about all these new interests that I had and so like done with this other kind of lifestyle and, and right. even the music at that point that I just you know, had to figure out a new path. Right. So how did you do that? What was your, uh, what was your first move then? You had you'd left, uh, left the school. How did you go about starting to establish your career? Yeah, very complicated in the sense that it was some fairly blurry years for a little while. It was hard for me, given who I was, to understand how to take uh, everything I studied and everything I knew and turn it into like starting to have a career. I really didn't have any clue at all. Mm -hmm. And like my parents, you know, as nice as they were or whatever, they didn't know how to help me either because all they knew was Juilliard and there were no... Berkeley's and Sweetwater's and you know all the different places that now kind of like you know are very supportive of uh, learning all these amazing instruments that we have. If you wanted to learn synthesizer, I mean, you either went to like a really academic place and learned how to do the bleeps and blops and the, you know, Morton Zabotnik, who I actually love, but his approach to like synthesis coming from that point of view, and I really wasn't into that. I was into the stuff that, you know, I was into the leads that I was hearing Mraz do and the cool, you know, glidey stuff that Wakeman was doing and the power of Emerson and all that. Right. That was like what was really on my mind. Had no idea how to put the two together. Matter of fact, what was a real problem for me in putting it together was that I was kind of convinced or even more like hypnotized to think that you know, classical musicians were you know, up here and everybody else was kind of like a lower form of life. Of course, we know that that's not true, but being a young person growing up from the age of nine in Juilliard, which was this very elite place with you know, seven-year-olds writing operas and stuff, that's kind of what I, all I knew. Sure. So uh, it took a while to figure it out. Mm -hmm. So the first thing I actually did was I started to, I got a mini Moog. And I started to like really have a lot of fun with it. I think my first real system was like a mini Moog and Taurus bass pedals, and then I filled it in with an ARP string machine. And I remember the feeling of having those three things. I was like, wow, right, nice. This is so awesome. Um, but I had put together a little um, like space music ensemble, kind of like Tangerine Dream, but even more like out there than that. Not as pitch oriented, more sonic. Uh, luckily. One of the um, professors that I had in the early years of Juilliard had left Juilliard as well at some point and was playing electronic music and was involved in, with some people that were inventing some really cool instruments. Mm -hmm. And he had something called a cromulizer, which he had made, which had little like elevator buttons on a plexiglass tube. Right. So I joined him and, um, and a guy named Sal Galina, who we had met along the little ride there. Sal Galina was one of the people who um, was, re was responsible for what became the WX7. Mm. Yeah. So, uh, so the three of us got together and we were playing a lot of improvisation. We do late night radio shows and just having a really like cool spacey time 
not really making any money at all, just kind of floating around and right. you know, doing some very wild, very out there music. Right. You know, so different things happen through the years. Um, you know, people say, well, how did you, you know, how did you make a living? What did you do? Da, da, da. Well, one thing, I, I, I had moved to Baltimore. I joined a band uh, that was like a, uh, kind of one of these local bands, but playing a lot of gigs, quite popular, and that kept me going for a few years. I had played in a lot of hotels and a lot of bars, and I'm always thankful that my mother used to bring home the sheet music, the guitar music with just the notes and the chords, and I was always, you know, playing those. And right. one day somebody said, how, how do you know what to play? You know, like, it's just a note, like the single melody note in the chords. I said, what do you mean? And, and I was like, you know, I'm just playing it. She said, but yeah, but there's no, what you're playing is not on the page. I was like, well, I don't know. This is like, this is, you know, this is what I'd always been doing. So that mm -hmm. skill was something that's very, very natural to me. And um, so luckily I was able to support myself whenever, you know, trying to figure stuff out. I'd say, I'll oh, call up a restaurant and go in, hey, do you need a pianist? So, um, so it was that part. And then uh, what happened was that uh, well, a lot of things, but I'll skip to the, to the part about realizing that a very nice way of kind of getting into the industry a little bit would be to hook up with some of the companies or one of the companies doing the synthesizers. Right. So I um, called up my good buddy Jack Hotop, who I knew from some years ago, and I told him my interest in that. And he was like, wow, you know, we actually have a uh, position for product specialists that's open. Why don't you come check it out? Right. So I went down to Korg and I got the job and that led to this whole phase of life where I was getting in front of people and uh, writing cool music, making cool sounds, making demos and meeting a lot of people in the industry. For me, it was a perfect kind of bridge to get from where I was, classical musician turned into somebody who didn't quite know how to, to interface and meet the people that were involved in this other kind of music that I enjoyed. But here I was in the industry meeting a lot of people, right. starting to get noticed and some you know, gigs came up. Like uh, I remember working at Korg and one day one of the guy, one of the salesmen or whatever came in and said, oh, Jan Hammer wants to talk to you. You know, I, right. think, I think they had actually waited like a couple of weeks after he called because it's, it's a little difficult sometimes for those people to uh, take somebody who's an employee and you know, <laughs> empower them like that. But they did, right. they did come in and I w ended up going to Jan Hammer's house to uh, program the wave station it was at that point for mm -hmm. his sounds. And then he asked me to be in his band with Tony Williams, and we did a four-piece thing and toured, and I played all the orchestrations, he played his guitar, right. and that was one of the first things, and working with Vinnie Moore, was, uh, the guitar player, was mm -hmm. really a key um, thing as well. And in those days, I was also starting to work with the Paul Winter Consort, totally different kind of music, and mm -hmm. mostly as a pianist, which was a great experience, because Paul Winter and his crew of musicians is, are you know, just great musicians. Um, and yeah, so that's kind of how you know everything happened, leading right. up to kind of the phase where I uh, played with the Drags because they had found out about me through the work that I was doing, kind of in the industry. Um, and by that point, I had also made a solo album. I had taken a break from Korg between working for Korg and working for Kurzweil, mm -hmm. and uh, I had done that. So those people had heard uh, heard that, read about me in the magazines. Right. Yeah, you were, uh, you were best new talent. In there was a key poll that kind of occurred out of all this kind of uh, new, you know, energy, which was really exciting. Right. And um, yeah, and that finally led to Liquid Tension Experiment, which was uh, uh, an instrumental group with Tony Levin and John Petrucci and Mike Portnoy from Dream Theater. Mm -hmm. And I had done two albums uh, with those guys before joining Dream Theater. And at the end of the second album, they reapproached me because they had asked me to join Dream Theater previously about the time that I joined the Dregs. Mm -hmm. Um, so when they asked me to join Dream Theater after the second Liquid Tension Experiment album, I was like, well, now it seems like a really good time to do that, so let's, let's uh, make that happen. Right. And that was 16 years ago. Right. And now, uh, actually, like this moment, we're mixing our latest uh, album, Dream Theater album. It's amazing. So, yep, it's all uh, coming together and continuing to uh, you know, flow. Yeah, ab are. absolutely, that, that's incredible. What a great, great pathway that, you, that you've, you've taken there. We were talking last night, and we actually met you here at Sweetwater in the early 90s, you were doing uh, Korg demonstrations yeah, and yeah. came into our original little building in the gravel right, parking right. lot over on Bass Road and, and uh, yeah. Yeah, came in and wowed us with your, your playing yeah. in those, uh, in those uh, days. I remember that. Yeah. And that's why I was so blown away when I walked in this facility and I'm like, oh my God, this place is incredible. <laughs> right. You know, right. I think I was led directly into the studio, which is so beautiful, and the control room, which is gorgeous. And I'm like, wow. And then slowly during the course of the next couple of days that I've been here, kind of 
seeing All the little things aspects, and yeah. this incredible you know stage and performance hall that we're in, which is so beautiful. Oh, well, thank you. So yeah, it's a yeah. great. I'm really impressed with the whole. Uh, you thank know, you very much. Thank you very much. Everybody's nice. It's yeah. all cool. Well, we have a good time. Yep, no doubt. So, so all these different types of music you've worked in, classical and the Paul Winter Consort, you mentioned Vinnie Moore, which is, a, he's more of a shred metal yeah, yeah. guitar player, and the space music stuff, and then the yeah. dregs. How do you prepare yourself to move into all those different styles of music? Um, luckily, I've always been the kind of musician who's been open, interested in playing different styles of music. Even when I was in Juilliard as a kid, I'd be the one to like drag the other kids into the room and play them some boogie woogie or some jazz chords or, you know, some of the stuff that later that I was listening to from like the Tony Banks School of Harmony and, oh, yeah. you know, so I was always doing that and I was also always playing like, you know, popular songs, songs from Broadway shows. My mother was like really, you know, uh, into bringing home music and putting it in front of me and saying, here, play this song. Right. So, uh, and I would always play at parties and everything like that. Although, during those years, the classical um, training was really pretty rigid and my teacher didn't really want to know about all that. It had to be a little bit like off to the side. Mm -hmm. I had to practice, you know, four or five hours a day to do what I was, you know, what I was being trained to do and also to perform as I needed to in sure. that environment. So, but, but I was still very open to all that and always interested. Um, and anything I heard, what I used to do is not so much like learn to, uh, like when I first heard Tarkas, I wasn't really that interested in learning how to play that piece, mm -hmm. but I was, what I was really aware of and really interested in was what are the harmonies, what's really going, what makes this music tick? And I had a teacher, um, a composition teacher, who would always say to me, okay, well you like that sound? Well, why don't you, this week, let's write a song or write a composition that uses the, you know, chords and fourths. Or this right. week, let's write something that's more like, you know, really dissonant and look for doing something with the half steps in it right. and build something. And I feel like from my particular, uh, you know, talent that that was like one of the best things that could have happened mm -hmm. because I just got to a point where everything that I would hear that I was interested in, I would almost like naturally incorporate. You know, incorporate. I would look. I would look for the harmony. Like right. if I, you know, heard a, uh, you know, flat nine chord or something like that, I would go, oh, I like that. And then I go to the piano. I go, mm, and I find it in every key. And I'd literally say, okay, find it in C, find it in A. Just kind of like talking to myself and going, okay, how fast can I put my hand on it here? Where's the, you know, where's the inversion? So I taught myself to quickly go to all the different inversions, with all the different kinds of chords that I was interested in. Even, even like you know, listening to like Todd Rundgren's music and his kind of chords, which are a lot of like triad kind of chords that are above different roots. Right. So maybe he's playing a C chord over an F and then he's going to an F chord over a B flat and then a G right. over an A. And you know, if he lands on a regular major chord, you're like, oh, that's cool. But that whole sound, it's a sound thing or like the Genesis thing where you have like a, um, you know, a, a bass note and you keep moving the chords around it. You're playing a D minor chord and then you're playing like, you know, an A minor above it and a G above it and an F and you're moving in this note and the bass note stays the same. Mm -hmm. So all those things and just bringing them all in to, uh, you know, my world. Right. Right, so, just kind of vacuum it all up and, yeah, and absorb yeah. it all and it becomes part of your style. So that's that been very natural yeah. to me. And luckily, you know, I ended up in a group where that kind of talent and that kind of skill is really appreciated and it comes into play. Because dream theater is all about kind of like, you know, bringing in different styles. I mean, it's prog metal, but nobody's that surprised if there's like a ragtime section or if there's some kind of, you know, bizarre jazz thing or right. whatever, you know. Yeah, yeah, right, right. So you've worked with... Two of the, certainly the very top guitar players, <coughs> Steve Morris and John Petrucci. Can you talk a little bit about the differences between those two players and what you take away from each of those? Totally. Well, when I had worked with Steve Morris, it was a very um, interesting time of my life because it was one of like the first, one of the first like really serious bands that I had been in and in, in that vein, certainly. And, you know, Steve is so amazing and all the guys in the band were kind of like, like idols to me growing up. Right. So... Um, I was just kind of really getting into my, my lead playing and I knew that the dregs music had sections which would kind of exist over a single kind of tonality, like they might be repeating a riff that was in D, for example, for 16 bars. Mm -hmm. So Steve would riff on, uh, would lead on that and then maybe it's my turn. And I never really thought so much about how I was going to, I started to think about how I was going to keep that interesting. 
So it made me really think, because you know, if you're just playing over D, well sure, you're gonna go for the pentatonic kind of scale and play like a blues thing or whatever, and that's fine. Mm -hmm. But over the course of 1632 bars, you gotta do something else. So being with Steve and listening to his approach and thinking about it a lot, led me to think about how can I really you know, weave some more interesting things? How can I get some stuff in there that fits the style but also keeps it interesting and harmonically um, and just shape-wise would be cool? So it was, right. a, it was a very developmental uh, point of my keyboard playing, mm -hmm. which was great. Um, it's a very funny story as I remember like walking into the first rehearsal uh, with the dregs. It was at Steve's house and I had learned um, a song, I think it was called Hereafter, and I learned it and I had written out the whole thing. And it was cool because I wrote it, it was like a measure of 4-4 four, four, and then a measure of 7-8 and then a measure of 5-4 and all, all the meters kept changing. I had it all, I thought, very nicely written, uh, written out. So I'm sitting there, I'm talking to Steve and I'm playing it and kind of like looking at my chart. He's going, okay, you know, cool, whatever. And then uh, Rod Morgenstein, who I hadn't met yet, but I was well aware of who he was, and he walks by in the hallway outside this room and he heard me talking, whatever, counting, and he comes in and he says, he says, wait, he says, that, that whole piece is in 4-4. I was like, what? <laughs> we didn't even say hello. He's walking and say, hey, that piece is in 4-4. Like, what are you talking about? I thought every measure is a different meter. He says, no, no, no. I just accent the different, you know, beats within mm. it. But those are not the, it's in 4. Uh, okay, <laughs> rip up the chart, start again. You know, like, but that was, you know, really a funny story. Right, right. So, um, anyway, so moving, so that was great. So learning with those guys was a lot about that kind of thing. And also, mm -hmm. one of the great things that Steve said, and every musician learns at some point, is, hey, like, when I'm playing a lead, chill out, sit back. Because in those days, it was more tempting for me to, like, overplay because I wanted to show what I could do. Mm -hmm. You know, hey, of course, when somebody plays a lead, <laughs> you got to lay back and be right. cool. It's one of the things you learn as you mature, mm -hmm. you know, no matter who you are, if you're, you know, a good player to, hey, hopefully, you know, you can learn how to relax and let somebody else have their spot and how to keep it simple. So, um... So that was a really great thing too. So then, you know, kind of fast forward to the John Petrucci days. And here, you know, when I first heard Dream Theater, what really struck me about it is here they were, they were playing progressive music with this metal, you know, edge to it. But the chops were so like absolute dead on. And I hadn't heard anything like that before. Never heard that combination with that kind of virtuosity. So it really caught me. Not that I was that much into metal, you know, I had played some guitar, I, I like playing Judas Priest and ACDC and it was all fun. Um, but it wasn't totally my thing, but I could relate enough that the progressive and the metal combination with those chops really struck me. Mm -hmm. So when I, when I joined that group and started to work with John, here was somebody that I was, even though I was coming from like Juilliard and he was coming from, you know, his background, which was like a year of Berkeley and maybe some private study, we were very much like connected because of our, our work ethic at mm -hmm. the instrument and our desire for like, you know, kind of like perfection or as close as we could get to it. Um, so that really has led to this great relationship in so many ways, not only because of just the approach to the instrument, but also just in, in the way that we write music together, we create music, it's just very synchronous. Mm -hmm. and, we cover, and we come from different sides, which I think is the reason that, one of the reasons that our group has been able to survive for a long time and kind of flourish, because that combination is like adding, you know, it's not like, if he did exactly what I did, it would be, you know, just so large as a concept. But because he covers a whole nother thing and I cover this, and together we can relate so much, it really does make it a bigger kind of like presence right. and something that's, uh, I think, just more uh, vital to what we do. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and I'm always learning from him. One of, the, one of the interesting things about John as a musician, and I guess all guitar players, but especially John, is that he is really, first of all, he's very, very smart in his approach to the instrument can be very pattern oriented, patterns on the guitar. Mm -hmm. So he'll see things in shapes and patterns on the guitar, which I find fascinating because it's not at all the way I think. You know, because on the keyboard you play like a C major chord is here and an A flat major chord is a totally different position on the guitar, that's just not the case. So he is used to thinking about these cool shapes and when I, you know, like learn or watch that, I, I'm, I'm fascinated. I don't, that's not my, you know, my thing at all. Right. So, uh, yeah, it's kind of like that. That mm -hmm. comes into play when we're writing together. He's like, oh, I thought of this great shape. My first thought was, well, what does it sound like? <laughs> you know? right, right. But often right. it's very cool because it is a shape and you can think like that. Mm -hmm. right. So those right. are some things. About so how does the writing process work for <coughs> the two of you? 
Um, well, let's see. Uh, it works. It works really well a lot of time, and it works differently a lot of times. In the in the past, um, for the most part, in our in our uh, history of working together, we would come in and really write a lot of it together in the mm -hmm. studio. We still kind of do that. Um, and, but we feed off of each other really well. Like if, if he's writing like a, just a musical line, like a linear kind of line, he might come up with a little something and I'll go, oh man, uh, how about we do this afterwards? And then we'll go back and forth and sometimes it gets funny because we'll start going really fast and we'll like crack up because it's just ridiculous. Um, and other times it's more like he'll have just like an idea for some chords or whatever and just maybe present something, four measures, eight measures, and, or a verse. And I'll say, oh, how about this for the chorus? And you know, so, it works, it works so nicely. Mm -hmm. um, and it's also, we get along so well. For this latest album, we, we got off the road, um, which will be out after the new year, um, but we got off the road and we were very excited about some of the ideas we were coming up with and we were really inspired. So I can remember going back home, sitting at my little digital piano in my house and recording like a ton of stuff and I'd be sending him stuff like every day, like check this out, check this out, all kinds of ideas. And when we got together, we kind of weeded through it and then we would sit, you know, just literally and just kind of try out some of the stuff and, mm -hmm. you know, get inspired and go back and forth. It's a lot of back and forth when we're working together. But a lot of the seeds are kind of done now, you know, on our own. And, Mm -hmm. And then we come together and, and do it. That's got to be fun. It is fun. Yeah. Yeah, it's one of the nice things that, you know, in my, uh, in my life as a musician now that we have that kind of uh, relationship. Mm -hmm. So last night at the workshop, uh, when you first came out, you sat down at the uh, grand piano yeah. and you improvised a piece. Right. Can you tell us a little bit about your approach to improvising? Do you start with a chord progression? Mm. And do you have a, a seed of a <coughs> motif or something in your, in your uh, brain that you're going to yeah, work yeah. off of? Yeah, I mean, I could, but it's generally not necessarily how I go into an improvisation. It's more about like a mood or a feeling or, uh, like last night is a perfect example. I thought I was gonna start and play a, a version of uh, Court of the Crimson King. Mm -hmm. That was my intention. I even had like the little chart to remind me of how it even goes in front of me. So, um, but when I sat down, I was like, I wasn't in the mood to play that. I just kind of was thinking, oh, I just wanna loosen up. A lot of, you know, a lot of starting a show for me when I'm doing it on my own is kind of about understanding the vibe getting comfortable, uh, becoming musical in the room. Mm -hmm. And I didn't want to have to be locked in, into any particular notes. So I walked in and I just started playing. And uh, it w the, the way the music came was not thinking about any particular motif or any kind of chords or any even kind of style. It was more about thinking, how can I get into, how can I kind of open myself up and just get into a, a feeling that I was enjoyable, that I could you know, bring into myself and, tra and transmit out to everybody else in this room. Right. So what's, like, what's resonant to me? What feels really musical? How can I create an energy that's just like, you know, enjoyable? Mm -hmm. And I was looking for something that, you know, if anything, the, the searching part was looking for something that felt very, um, like kind of like full and, and, and just really like, this is a smooth musical experience. Right. So that's, that's what it was. All right. Well, so. the piece sounded fully realized because you sat down there with an <coughs> intro and then clearly a development section and then an, oh, ending, an ending to it. Is that something you consciously strive for to have a form when you're improvising or does it just, just Sometimes, go? yeah. I mean, definitely sometimes. If I, you know, if I start something, well, you know, I may be spacey, but I'm not like an idiot, you know. I'll realize, <laughs> okay, well, I start playing these chords and I'm not going to end up in a completely different style necessarily. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, so the form factor kind of comes into play, but it's more like, it's kind of more, a little bit more linear. Like it's like building a shape, like I'm doing this and I go, da, 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 go here, then I can bring it down and kind of like trail off at the end. And mm -hmm. so it becomes like that with, with an awareness. Hopefully I can remember whatever I did at the beginning. Maybe I won't play it exactly the same because I don't remember it because it's just mm -hmm. uh, you know, off the top of my head. Right. So, um, but yeah, I mean, I'm ideally looking for some kind of a, you know, a form, or keeping it within a, a kind of stylistic idea. Mm -hmm. Right, right. You did another piece where you were playing a, a chord cronus, <clears throat> and you were playing an acoustic guitar sound. Right. I'm curious, as a keyboard player playing the sound of another instrument, right. do you feel constrained by what that instrument can do? Do you feel like I have to play this the way a guitar player would play it, mm -hmm. or do you feel, do you open it up more than that? Um, well, uh, I definitely am aware, and I've thought a lot about uh, how the different instruments actually are played. Um, so that matters to me to make mm -hmm. it, if it's, if it's whatever, whatever sound it is, I'm, I'm more conscious of the actual timbre 
and respect to the timbre and what it actually is is doing to the bigger kind of sonic picture, then I'm thinking about, well, this is what a guitar player would do. So like, let's say I call up a sound. Let's not even call it a guitar. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's a guitar type sound, but it's a sound. And I hear that when I get over a certain note, it gets very kind of bright, and the sound is not really a very attractive. Then I'm not gonna play in that area. Or if I you know, roll a chord, and it sounds awkward because there's some kind of like uh, harmonics that just aren't lining up, then I won't do that either. So I'll be very, I'm very like sound sensitive in that sense. Um, and I'll just be, and I'll try to be very responsive to the sound and what it means to me. Mm -hmm. So it comes more from that point of view rather than really caring. Well, if I go da -da 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 like if a guitarist could play that, great. If he can't, I don't care because it sounds cool to me. Right. You know, given that, you know, given that sound. And very often when I'm making my sounds, what I'll do is I'll choose an element like a like a acoustic guitar element and I'll add something to it maybe I'll add some kind of like little wave sequency kind of like flowing sound or some little extra attack or release sound to it so it becomes more you know my own thing mm -hmm. I'm 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 not so much as a musician necessarily interested in trying to uh, emulate as I am in trying to just create something that might be you know really special and yeah, because I think if you're trying to just imitate, well, it's not necessarily going to be as good as what you're trying to imitate. Right. Although I will say the other part of that is, well, sure, in my musical life, I'm called upon to orchestrate and, hey, let's put a French horn part and I'll put a French horn part or put a string part and it's, you know, the best strings I can find. So there is that part. Right. But uh, my higher interest, if you will, as a musician is, uh, musician is coming up with colors that are original mm -hmm. because I'll never get, you know, the sound that's necessarily as great as... Uh, you know, a real instrument. Although you can get pretty damn really close, close nowadays. Yeah, pretty convincing. Which can be very fun and, you know, musically rewarding. But I think as a synthesis, as a programmer, as a keyboardist, it's a little bit more interesting to think about creating something new. Mm -hmm. Well, that segues very well into our <coughs> next topic, which is you are heavily into technology <coughs> and looking at new ways to approach music. Yeah. And one of those is with your company, Wisdom Music. Can right, you tell us, right. what's that about? What do you do there? Okay, so um, years ago when the uh, iPhone first came out, I was uh, sat and I was playing with one and, and there was a very uh, preliminary kind of like piano app with like one octave and like a, some buzzy sound or whatever. And I uh, was just sitting down, I was playing and just really focusing on it because I had some ideas in mind. And actually my wife uh, looked at me playing with this thing. We had just bought a beautiful Steinway Grand, which is sitting <laughs> in the other room. And she's like, what are, you, what are you doing? Like, why are you making that ridiculous sound? We have this incredible <laughs> piano in the other room we just bought. Right. <clears throat> she was not very happy at that moment. <laughs> so uh, I said, no, 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 honey, I got something in mind here. I'm, I'm onto something. And she thought I was, she thinks I am, but she thought I was really, really, really <laughs> crazy. So, um, but I had something in my mind, and I kept my eye on this emergence of this, you know, iTunes app store, s and to see, like, what was happening. And it there was nothing really happening at that point, but very slowly but surely, different creative people were putting up apps, mm -hmm. and I wanted to see if I could maybe find somebody to talk to about my ideas. So um, this guy whose name is Kevin Chartier had released an app, and it had some kind of like vertical throw of notes, and I thought, and it was very simple, but it was kind of cool. I called him up, I said, hey, my name's Jordan Rudis, blah, 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 and I want to, you know, work on an app idea. You, would you be interested to work together? So he was like, yeah, that sounds really cool. So uh, we started a relationship. I started a company and, uh, called Wisdom Music, with a Z, mm -hmm. and, uh, and Kevin and I worked on our first app, which was called MorphWiz, which was really exciting for me. Even to this day, I can kind of point people there if they want to know the kinds of things that I'm thinking about. And it's even, it's even um, information about some of the other things that we're building with these other instruments that I'm involved in. And the reason it is is because I was exploring um, the idea of, of, of a vertical kind of grid for the playing surface where you could have any number of uh, octaves in whatever scale you wanted. So let's say you wanted two octaves of a uh, C harmonic minor scale. You could put those notes in front of you and you could slide your finger over it and you could lock into the pitches. So it would just play the scale just by a gesture or you could slide and be fretless. Because my dream was to be able to articulate absolute notes or slide between them as I wanted to at the moment. So with this vertical grid, I was able to put whatever scale and that worked very nicely if I locked the pitch and if I took the, like the pitch lock off or the rounding off, 
then I could slide. Mm -hmm. In addition to that, what I wanted to do is I wanted to have control of various elements like timbre, you know, the volume, filter, whatever, on the vertical throw of a note, independently per note that I was playing. Right. So we did that with Morph Wiz, plus adding a visual element, which is that you could not only morph between some basic waveforms, but you could also morph between some like visualizations that I chose for the different waveforms that we had. So altogether, it was kind of like this concept that, you know, looking back now, I mean, the sounds are not like that great, the visuals are not that great, but it's really fun. It looks mm -hmm. kind of cool even today on your, uh, iPhone, or it's also available on Android. Um, so that was like the start of, uh, of all these things. And then we went from there, and I had some other ideas that I wanted to do. The next thing that we produced was something called Sample Wiz, which was this, uh, I wanted to have like a, I missed the days of the old uh, Casio sampler, what was it called? The SK-1, right? SK-1, thank yeah. you. Uh, I love that thing, I yeah. played with it all the time. And I thought, you know what, wouldn't it be great to have something like that on the iPhone that was, you know, fun, and even on a, like a higher level, you could do more. Right. So um, we created Sample Wiz, and on that, it's pretty cool because you can do things like, you can sample a sound and then you can put it into what we call modern mode, which will just change the formants and the time to keep everything more time aligned. And so you can take one sample and pretty much play it through the range, mm -hmm. which is fun. And then I woke up one morning <clears throat> and my, I called up my programmer and I, and I said, Kevin, I said, how about allowing um, us to play on the waveform? I wanna put my finger on the different areas of the waveform and actually hear what's under my finger at that point and be able to use that as like a performance kind of technique. And then I wanna be able to go vertically in whatever right. zone and also do that and independently per finger. And he was like, oh, okay, I think I can do that. I was like, oh, great. Yeah, nice. <laughs> cool. So one thing led to another and I started to really uh, enjoy the flexibility that this kind of multi-touch experience would lend itself towards expression. And that, and that brought me to, the, to uh, working with an instrument called the Continuum, which was uh, designed by Lippold Hocken. Mm -hmm. He's an incredible you know, mind and instrument maker and it's a beautiful instrument. Uh, and that was the beginning of a journey talking about um, intelligent ways to deal with pitch when it comes to articulating absolute notes and also sliding between notes. So he and I had a lot of conversations about that because when I first got the continuum, he kind of had this thing called like initial rounding. It kind of worked, but I helped him tune it in. And then I also realized that when we were sliding on a note, we needed to be able to slide to a destination and have that destination actually kind of round or you know, we'll say snap to pitch mm -hmm. uh, over a certain amount of time to create this music magic that I was looking for. So you think about it, like, you know, a violinist is sliding a note, he goes from here to here and he stops and doesn't vibrato. The chances of landing exactly on pitch without like shaking and kind of making it a little more comfortable for the ear, are pretty minimal, unless you're, you know, Heifetz or somebody, you know. Right. So, right. I thought, wouldn't it be cool to have it so you could slide, stop, and it goes, and it's in tune, <laughs> and then you vibrato from there, and mm -hmm. everybody's happy. So we kind of got that together. and started to, I started to use that in my apps, and Lippold put that in, in the continuum, and, uh, you know, that's kind of how it Yeah, is. amazing stuff. And it has gone on from there. But. Right, it, and that which <coughs> brings us to the next thing, is that three manufacturers actually helped sponsor bringing you in here to Sweetwater, yeah, right. and that was CME Korg, and above all, uh, Rolly. Yes. And you've been heavily involved in their new Seaboard. Can you tell us about that yeah. instrument and your involvement <coughs> in it? The Seaboard is so exciting for me. It's, um, the reason that it is, is because it kind of incorporates the idea of a traditional piano keyboard layout which is so familiar to everybody. It's been around for how many years? Hundreds of years. Um, but it also brings in all the elements that I've been thinking about for so long that you know, some of my friends in the, in the world of expressive new controllers have been thinking about, about as well. But it brings it in in a way that is so relatable, not only to me, but I think to you know, most other people too, because mm -hmm. again, it's based on the piano keyboard. So I mean, I play all the different expressive instruments and I love them for what they are. Um, but this one is especially close to my musicality and my heart because it is based on a keyboard and I can do the kind of things that I want. I mean, my dream has been since the beginning was to articulate notes and then to be able to freely slide between definite notes. So when my good friend Roland Lamb first came to my house um, with a partner of his and he, um, just to show me the seaboard, 
uh, he opened it up and I put my hand down on, on it and I said, what took you so long to get here? <laughs> He's like, Jordan, he says, I, I know I'm sorry. I knew I had to show it to you, but I wanted it to be in a certain form before I did. Mm -hmm. So I said, okay, well, we have to work <laughs> together because this is like so my thing. This is exactly what right. I've been waiting for. But what's really cool is that, you know, I had been experimenting with my own stuff with apps and I still do. You know, I was playing the continuum. I played eigenharps and, you know, wonderful things like a instrument and all this stuff. Um, but the idea of taking, and they're all great, but the idea of taking a keyboard, which to me in its, you know, it, what we've known so far is keys go down and they come up. They're kind of like on and off switches. It's a very switch kind of mentality. Mm -hmm. But here we are, and we've taken this instru instrument that we've known as like being a switch on and off instrument, right? And all of a sudden it's like this moldable experience. That's why we call the, the uh, actual keys of the seaboard key waves. Mm -hmm. So the beauty of that is you can use all these techniques, uh, like you can do legato bend, where maybe you play a C, and if you kind of gesture or play legato into the C sharp, it, it will actually bend pitch. So you can bend pitch by the way you play between the notes, but you can also slide off of the notes onto the ribbon that's either below the key waves or above the key waves. So at any point I can play, you know, a riff, da 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 da, -da slide to whatever note I want and have that kind of like flexibility that I wanted. But to me, it's kind of a small miracle that somebody was able to think about how do you take a keyboard, which is this one way of thinking, and make it fluid. Right. So you know, those reasons are why I'm so excited. And, I'm, and even beyond being excited, I think that the seaboard is a really important instrument in the course of our kind of evolution of, of expressive instruments and electronic instruments. The reason I do is because all these other guys have made great things. They're all wonderful. They're all, for the people who are aware, they're all changing the game. Mm -hmm. But they're too left of center to really make a difference. This instrument deserves to be recognized by musicians who are you know, making any kind of music, especially like with the new product that they're making called the Rise, which is a, you know, small two octave controller with some sliders on it and an XY pad. I mean, something like that, anybody who has a keyboard, a small keyboard and a computer that's arranging, composing, making music, kind of needs to know about it, needs to be aware of it. Right. Um, because it's, it, it has the potential to really change the way that they make music. Anybody who needs to put a violin part and they need to have a vibrato, well, instead of using the canned sample or a modulation wheel to do that, hey, with this instrument, you can put your finger down and you can, you know, shake your finger at the vibrato speed you want. Mm -hmm. uh, it also has something called slide. And, in, and in slide is when you actually move your finger on the key and you can move it up and down almost like a mixer. And it's all, and if you're a, like a keyboard player, then you can totally start to take advantage of all the sophisticated kind of touch. This is what, what they call 5D touch. Mm -hmm. This is so many elements. You can press into the key, you can go left or right, you can, you can do the slide, it'll recognize how fast that you're lifting off of the key. So all these kind of things make a very kind of organic, expressive experience. So everybody from keyboard players who want their touch to mean more on an instrument and finally really connect in a way that the classical musicians always hoped that we wouldn't, you know, <laughs> by saying, oh, it's not organic, it's not real. At this point, it's almost like directly connected with your physicality right. in a way that, I don't know, never experienced anything like it. Um, so I think it's, it's important for me not only to be excited about it, but to also help it get, you know, out there and get to be accepted because, of course, there's a little bit of a, you know, a, an acceptance, uh, you know, learning curve, if you will, of it because it, although it has a piano-shaped keyboard, it is a bit different. So mm -hmm. people have to embrace it and find out about it, be educated, and give it a, give it a go. Right, right. So. The expressive possibilities <coughs> are so amazing. Listening to you play it, you were playing, uh, last night again, you were playing some kind of synth sounds, but also cellos and different instruments and the, yeah, the expressiveness yeah. you can bring to that. Do you have to have uh, virtual instruments that are programmed to accept what comes out of it? Does it have built-in sounds, or how does that work? Yeah. Um, well, like the Rise, the newest one, actually ships with uh, something called Equator, and that works like out of the box. It's just easy. You plug it in, and it plays. And mm -hmm. when your fingers go down on, on the seaboard, basically what's happening is they are um, transmitting on different MIDI channels. So with some software that's friendly to that, you don't have to think about anything complicated, about having multiple instances, about setting up different programs. It's just straight ahead and it's wonderful. Mm -hmm. um, with some other things, though, you do have to think about that. Um, so one of the, one of the um, 
responsibilities of Roly as a company is to start to create little sound sets for people who are using the various popular virtual instruments. So if you're using whatever Vienna instruments, East-West stuff, uh, you know, Spitfire, hey, well, we've got a sound set you know, for right. you. I think that they really need to do that so people can you know, not have a hard time and just get use it to access the sounds that they love. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's totally possible. They make something called Polythrough that actually uh, will easily make multiple instances of an instrument and make the assignments that you need, like pitch bend per instance. Um, so Roly, and the other, the other difference, I guess, with Roly compared to some of the other companies that are doing you know, interesting expressive instruments is Roly is able to take a very active lead and go out there and talk to all these companies, big and small, about how to make this really work. You know, right. that's, that's, the, you know that's, a, that's a major thing, that kind of outreach and getting, getting you know, all the coders in these various companies to accept the fact that, okay, there's all this information coming through, how are we gonna use it and how are we gonna make it really possible? Right. It's a little hard to ignore right now. You know, they yeah. have to understand that people are really interested in this stuff and make it possible to make it, you know, seamless. Right, right. Well, we're very excited about it. I think it's a, cool. a tremendous development. You also, last night, were uh, doing some playing on the CME X key. Tell us about that. Yeah, so um, the X key is, you know, it's, uh, it's an amazing little instrument. It's um, extremely thin. Mm -hmm. It's got real size keys. It's velocity sensitive. It has polyphonic aftertouch. It's, a, uh, it's, it's like a little friend of a keyboard player. It's, it's, uh, it, the new version that I was introducing is actually Bluetooth. It was amazing. Capable. Wireless. Yeah. So for me, um, working with the guys at CME, <clears throat> they're all about like mobile music. That's their whole thing. Uh, it's a Chinese company, really, really cool guys. Mm -hmm. The guy who runs it, this guy Zhao, is a good friend of mine. Um, and we've been working together to uh, you know, think about what kind of instruments keyboard players in this case will really want. So what we've come up with is something that I think that is just like, the kind of thing that any keyboard player would want to have with them. It's just so, it's so fun, it's so light, it's built well, it does the trick, and it's just a really cool little thing. There's nothing yeah. else like it. No. You know, the only thing to say about it is that, you know, it doesn't have the full throw of a, uh, you know, like a piano kind of action. It has a short throw, but it is velocity sensitive and it's sturdy. I've taken it on all these trips throughout the world and, right. you know, um, 
So it's like, cool, you know, people should know about it, mm -hmm. you know, check it out, put one in their suitcase and have some fun. You know, it's even great. I, I have one, uh, I'm a guitar player with <coughs> limited keyboard skills yeah. past my piano proficiency in college. You know, that was about the extent of it. Yeah, yeah. And uh, I have the 25 key sitting on my desk awesome. in my studio because yeah. it's so convenient to have a tiny keyboard yes. there just for entering notes and for playing in it's parts perfect. and doing yeah. things. So it's, it's ideal for right. that kind of situation right. as well. Yeah. yeah, I was sitting in my uh, studio, I don't know, about a month ago, and I had the X key air there and I also had a prototype of the Rise Seaboard, and they're both Bluetooth capable keyboards, and I'm thinking, wow, I'm like the only one in the world right now who has like totally these two, uh, yeah, <laughs> two Bluetooth keyboards. Like, nice. It was kind of a fun feeling. Right, right, that's awesome. That's and also, you know, it's, what's great is that, you know, I consult with both Roly and CME, mm -hmm. and, you know, everybody really gets along very well. The Seaboard is so different, really, than the X key, right. that it's all like you know, it's all it's all good. And they're complementary almost. They are. Yeah. yeah. Think about it that way. Totally. Yeah. Yeah. So you, uh, interestingly, in the, the virtuoso keyboard world, many times you see guys with stacks and stacks of keyboards and modules and things on stage. You tend to focus around a single controller keyboard with some alternate mm -hmm. controllers and things. Yes. And uh, the Korg Kronos mm -hmm. has loomed large there as, as your controller. What led you to choose that as your right, instrument? Right. Well, um, you know, ever since my days as a product specialist, um, I've been... I kind of like even needed to like learn these keyboards that were coming out a little deeper than the average guy. Right. So I had to show them, I had to demo them, and you know the key, the instruments for years have been so powerful, and most people haven't had the time or don't take the time to really learn what's under the hood. Mm -hmm. and this is you know everybody's busy and there's a lot of different kinds of keyboards, and the tendency for people is to go, okay, well, you know, I got this instrument here, and this makes a great clavinet sound, and this one really specializes in bells, and this one does that. And I've heard that story from so many people, and yeah, it is maybe true that this one has a great piano sound, this one does this, this one does that. Sure. But the reality has been that, that even going back 10 years, you could get an instrument and program it, and you could pretty much do everything that you wanted to do on the one instrument. Mm -hmm. So my approach, just first of all, because I was working for the companies and I was thinking along those lines, was to get the maximum out of the, key, out of the keyboard. But the other reason I was never really into doing this is because I noticed that every time the keyboard players do that, they lift their hand off this phrase early to get over here. Mm. So, and I hated that. It just, you know, it goes against like my, classical like musicality sense, I want to be able to finish the phrase. Mm -hmm. So I thought, okay, well what I can do is I can build my splits and layers and I can sample and I can get everything that I want to happen out of one keyboard. Um, and, and for many years also the other challenge was that even doing that, there would be breaks in the sound when I would switch. So I would, so many years I'd just be incrementing patches and gigs and you know, basically I'd go through a, a gig and play 300 patches on a single keyboard. Mm -hmm. So, the biggest issue with that was that whenever the sound changes, the sound would stop. So if I went from program number one to number two, all of a sudden there'd be a little, you know, going right. back more years, there'd be a, a real delay. Right. Then that delay got smaller and smaller, processors get quicker, and then it's faster, but still the sound would stop. And I would tell my friends at Roland and my friends at Korg and everybody, hey, musicians don't want the sound to stop. That's like... A big rule, you know, we want the sound to continue. Right. So, um, and I got the feeling that they were kind of, you know, maybe listening a little bit, but not really, didn't quite get it. You know, this com these companies are quite large and there's so many factors involved. But finally, after enough hammering from me and others as well, um, 
the, the guys started to make it happen. Roland came out with a version of the Phantom that had some nice kind of patch preserve and you know, kept some of the effects and it was mm -hmm. very pleasant. And Korg then kind of upped the game a little bit and had like even more parts per combination and, uh, and managed finally with the Kronos to make it so that nothing got interrupted. You could be on a patch, it could have, you know, 16 different parts with different sounds everywhere. You switch the sound, totally different sound. You could still be holding something. All the reverbs and all the effects remain and it's perfect. Mm -hmm. So to me at that point, I was like, okay, well my musical life just got that much better. I right. can have the, the layers I want, I can do whatever sampling into the machine that I want, I can do splits, I can do whatever, it's not gonna interrupt, interrupt the sound. So I, you know, every year I become a happier keyboardist because the toys, the instruments get more musical. Mm -hmm. So, and that's really the case with the, with the Kronos. And people say, well, why don't you use like, you know, main stage or something like that? And, you know, I think that those things are wonderful, it's great, I'm totally, I support, you know, uh, computers and instruments and all the software, it's all great. Mm -hmm. But for me on stage, I wanted to have a dedicated instrument. I didn't want to rely on my computer. I go through so many sounds in a night. I don't want to think about that. I know the kind of people and engineers and musical minds behind Korg. I know what they put into making a musical instrument, a solid one piece. This is my musical instrument. This is what it does. Right. I've had enough experience to know that, you know, they're so robust. I take my Kronos all over the world. I've had like no problems with it. You know, and the whole last tour, I did nothing happened at all. So, I mean, you know, knock on wood. Right. But I mean, it, but in general, you know, the, I think that that my thinking about it is is true. I mean, you know, they make great stuff, and uh, it's sturdy, and it works, and it's musical, and it sounds great. My biggest issue is it's a little hard to. You know, and they know, you know, it's a little hard for me to press on the screen and, you know, putting on my glasses and seeing what's going on. But right. once it's all together and programmed, it's a total joy. And especially in my dream theater world, it works so well. Awesome. Yeah. Right. All right. That's great. That's great. Let's wrap up here with one last question. I always like to ask when I have an extremely high level musician like yourself here, you've worked with everyone from Tony Levin to The Dregs to uh, David Bowie, Stephen Wilson, uh, obviously Dream Theater. What is it or what is the defining characteristic that makes someone <clears throat> an amazing high level musician like that? Yeah, um, I find that all of the people that you mentioned are very, very focused. They're, you know, they have a passion about music. I think it's the passion about music that kind of leads them to just wanting to create. Mm -hmm. um, you know, some of those people are into the actual virtuosic sense of the instrument, in which case you're trying to achieve this, this technique which allows you to express, you know, any kind of music. And, and while I'm there, I'll say that a lot of people get confused about technique because they think technique means that you're, you're able to play like something really fast and maybe really clean. But in the bigger picture, what, if somebody has a really great technique on an instrument, it really means that they're able to play something incredibly fast and clean, but they're also able to express like a beautiful melody and have it be really well articulated and played. And really, I think it has a lot to do with, technique has to do with taking your, your um, musical ideas that are in your mind and transferring, transferring them to your, you know, to your fingers, basically. Mm -hmm. That's what it's about. Doesn't matter if it's fast, slow. And somebody can say, oh, "I like this player because he plays slow and it's great. He doesn't do all that fast stuff." Well, I'm sure they're probably great. Mm -hmm. But if the player can play the bigger picture and articulate a really fast line and also play something really beautiful and slow, well, that to me is a virtuoso. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So the common thread, though, is this dedication to music and expression and, and even to their art form. If they're not going to sit there practicing the guitar, like my buddy Stephen Wilson, he's not sitting practicing scales today, but he's probably sitting, you know, in front of his uh, technology and working on a beautiful sound with the effects and building some kind of a color or writing some music and really thinking about the, the structure of it. And, you know, that's a constant kind of uh, um, work 
ethic that where you're co constantly energizing what you have in your mind. Right. Uh, I think that's the common thread. Right, right, awesome. Very well said. Cool. Right. right. Jordan, we appreciate you being here. Awesome. It's been well, such a pleasure, and you've done, uh, you've done uh, the tremendous workshop. We're looking forward to the master class tonight, and sessions, and this video, and other videos. Man, we're keeping you busy. Well, it took me a while to get here, because my schedule is so crazy. Right. But uh, having finally arrived, I can say it's been an absolute pleasure, and I'll definitely be coming back. I was going to say, please come back and make it soon. We'd love to have cool. you back here. Awesome. Great. Thanks, man. You bet. Okay. Thank you. Great. I'm Mitch Gallagher. Thanks for joining me for the Sweetwater Minute.